Welcome everyone to week two of our Made for More growth group series. We're glad you're joining us again and uh, hope you had a great week last week getting to know your group a little bit. Recently I heard a news account about a man who lost his finger because his wedding ring got caught on his ute. This was in the Yahoo News from Australia and it said this, Dean Outlaw from the Central Coast was packing up his ute after work on Friday when suddenly he slipped and his wedding ring got caught on a bolt. The pressure of the ring ripped off his finger and the finger, he said, it went flying. Well, when I read that story, my first question was, what's a ute? <laughs> Do you know what a ute is? Well, a ute, ute, I guess in Australia, is a utility vehicle. So he was packing up his pickup, right? And he got his finger caught on the ring, caught on his finger, and his finger just flew off. Dean Outlaw said this, and I was going to try to do it in, in an Aussie accent, but I'll spare you that. He said, I rang my wife, who was five minutes down the road, and asked her to come and get me. She came out, and she and the cu customer had to go looking through the back of the ute to find the finger. The wedding ring just peeled it off. I can't even think of a way to describe it, he said. Just the pressure bunched it all up until the skin was given away and shot it off like a, a champagne cork. Now, this is where the story gets interesting, okay? <laughs> because, of course, they found the finger, they took it, they sewed it back on. And when they sewed it back on, what happened was blood was able to flow into his finger, but not out of his finger. I don't know, they didn't, I don't know how that works. But so his finger began to swell. So here's what they did they put leeches on it. <laughs> like modern science, they put leeches on it in hopes that that would keep the, the finger from like exploding. They're going to try some other things and hopefully they can save his finger. I don't know how this all turned out for Dean. Um, but so I wanted to show you a picture of it. You want to see a picture of it? Uh, okay, never mind. Some of you have already Googled it, right? You've already Googled it and you see it. Now here's why I'm telling this story. The, the reason this story grosses us out is because we know that a finger unattached from the body no longer is a finger. I mean, it's just a mass of flesh. And unless it's reattached, it's totally useless. I mean, it's not, it doesn't have any function at all. And, and, and see, our body is designed, right, to function as a unit. Each part can't run off and do its own thing. It's just like biologically impossible. If our body parts aren't attached, they become useless. So through the years, I've heard people say something like, well, I believe in Jesus. I follow Jesus, but I'm not a part of his church. Well, I, I think I know what people mean by that. I think they mean I haven't found a place to connect. But, I, but theologically, I just want to say that's impossible. Because if we are in Christ, we are a part of the body. And as we've already discovered, as in the physical body, our spiritual body cannot function unless we're connected. So, so it's, the Bible is really clear about this. You know, for, for me to say I'm a Christian but not a part of the church is, is for a finger to say I'm a finger but I'm not a part of the body. It's nonsensical. The church is the body of Christ. We, we need to let that sink in. The church is the body of Christ. And this is what it says in Ephesians 1. We talked about this in the sermon on Sunday. This was the key verse for this first chapter. It says, And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, catch this, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. You see, the church is the body of Christ to carry his fullness, Christ's fullness, into every crack and crevice and cranny of society. It, the verse said it fills, the church fills everything in every way. The church, which is the body of Christ, fills everything in every way. See, Jesus is more, therefore the church is made for more. And that's why we talked on Sunday about the key concept, the key shift in chapter 1 from less effort to more Jesus. So like if we're, going to, if we're going to understand that we're made for more, we have, to, we have to understand that it's not what we do, but it's what Jesus has done. It's more Jesus. We're reminded Sunday that more Jesus means we learn to rest in the gospel and put our identity in Christ. We learn that we need to practice a radical dependence on the spirit. We need to pray without ceasing and we need to share the gospel every day in word and deed, first to ourselves and then to others. But now I want to drill down a little bit more here in chapter 1 and try to set this idea that the church is the body of Christ to deliver the fullness of Christ to every crack and cranny of, of society, everything, everywhere. And I want to see how does that idea fit into the chapter. So if you read chapter 1, or you will here in a moment, 
or in your group at least, it says in the first 14 verses, it, chapter 1 of Ephesians is just full of adverbs and adjectives and verbs and nouns that describe the, what we called in the Jonah series the relentless grace of Jesus. It's just, it's just phrase after phrase pouring on the radical, amazing grace of Jesus. It's, you just need to live in that first 14 verses and let it soak to your soul and your spirit. This is what Jesus has done for you. And in verses 15 through 21, Paul shifts to a prayer. And he begins to say, because all that Jesus has done for you, church, here's what I want you to understand. And in this prayer, he highlights three things. In verse 15, he says, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. So Paul starts by saying, man, this, this fullness of Jesus starts by faith, by just trusting Jesus and growing in our trust for Jesus. You know, I, I, I'm on Twitter. I don't tweet very often. But one of these days, I just want to tweet this. I just want to tweet, Jesus, that's the tweet. <laughs> like, just, it, it's all about Jesus. And, and, and so Paul commends the church at Ephesus, and he says, you have faith in Jesus. So let's start there. Let's start by saying, if we're going to be, understand that we're made for more, if we're going to be all that God created us to be, let's just come back and make everything about Jesus. Paul goes on, though. And he says, I keep, in verse 17, I keep asking that the God of the Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Why? So that you may know him better. And he, he says, I pray that your eyes would be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance and his holy people. Here's Paul's prayer. Like, this is such a cool prayer. Paul's saying, first of all, you have faith in Jesus. Good job. Now I'm praying that you'll understand that more and more and more every day, in every way, in everything. Like, Paul is, like, what a great prayer. Like, you want to know what to pray for your kids and your grandkids? You want to know what to pray for your neighbors, whether they know Jesus or not? You want to know what to pray for your pastor, <laughs> for your leaders, for the president, for the governor? Pray that their eyes would be opened, that they would see more and more of Jesus, that we may have the revelation to know him better. We live in a, as I mentioned, a Twitter world, a Facebook world. We want these little quotes and memes and something to get me through the day. And I just, that's great, that's fine. But what I really want is for us to know more and more of Jesus. If we are going to be who he's created us to be, we need to ask that prayer. We need to pray that prayer every day. Give me more of you. And then Paul concludes in verse 19, comes near the end in verse 19. He says, I'm praying that you'll understand his wisdom and revelation and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion in every name that is invoked, not only in the present, but in the one to come. Paul is asking that God would give the Ephesians a recognition of the power that is theirs, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. More Jesus. Paul is really saying, give us more Jesus, more understanding of the power of Jesus. That we would be secure in him so that we can be his body in every corner of society. So in this chapter, Paul is saying, if by faith we are continually asking that we can know God better, we will experience his increasing power. And then Paul takes us back to the key verse in this whole chapter. And he says again that God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So here's, here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, more Jesus, less effort equals greater results. Now, he's not saying no effort, right? It's just less effort, less of us and more of Jesus. A deepening understanding of who he is. A deepening awareness of his power. A deepening faith in his personhood. And letting Jesus be central. We're not passive spectators, but we are the body of Christ in every crack and crevice of, of culture when we allow him to reveal more of himself to us. So that's what I want you to talk about in your groups tonight. I want you to pray around that you would know Jesus more. You, first of all, you have faith in him. You would know him more. You would know his power so that we can be the body of Christ everywhere that he calls us. We are made for more. More Jesus, less effort, and better results. Talk about it in your group.